Well, multiculturalism is the idea that the cultures can all be put together in a single place with no overarching structure or undergirding structures. Like, that's not the case. How can that possibly be the case? That defines the situation in the world. And the world is full of war. So how, does the, how can that possibly work? If you're going to bring people together and they're going to be, and they're going to exist together in harmony, they have to be playing a game that everyone plays, that everyone knows the rules for. It can't be ten different sets of rules for different people. That isn't going to work. So it's, it's absolutely naive to believe. How, if that worked, the world wouldn't be full of war. Well, before we had, you know, multiculturalism, we still did have war. War, in fact, war is, yeah. as Stephen Pinker, I'm sure you read your Stephen Pinker says, you know, this is the least violent time in human history. So yes, something well, that's is working. that's a consequence of working. the patriarchal tyranny. Well, so if you think that the patriarchy has been eroded over the last hundred years, maybe that's what it's down to. Maybe you could give some credit to it for that. Mm, I actually didn't say that the patriarchy had been eroded. Well, and, you know, because you don't believe it exists in the first place. Fair enough. Mm. But I, my definition of multiculturalism is citizenship based, right? So you can be both Canadian and First Nations. You can be both Quebecois and also Canadian. Uh, you yeah, know, but that means that everybody in the multicultural milieu is one thing and another. Right. But they're all one thing. And another. Yeah. Yeah, well, you but know, our Prime Minister said, well, there is no Canadian identity. It's like, well, okay, what is it that unites us? Well, well nothing. We all protect our cultures. It's like, well, that leads to war. Okay. That well, doesn't only lead to war, obviously, but unless you have people operating within a shared framework of perception and value, they can't cooperate and compete uh, peacefully. I, there's, I don't understand how that's even a disputable topic. That's how you organize people. Okay, I, I think, if reasons. that's what he said, that's what Trudeau said, that is a dumb thing for the Prime Minister of Canada to say when you are Prime Minister of Canada. I yeah, you might, you might say that. I would agree right. much more mm. with what Barack Obama said when he said, you know, I'm trying not to make a red states of America or blue states of America or white America, black America. I'm trying to make a United States of America. And that to me yes, is... Yes, the Democrats are very good at that. Well, they, they Play, tried... They've played identity politics for the last 20 years. And all they've done is inflame tribal, tribal tendencies, as far as I can tell. So he can say that, but it isn't obvious that it's the case. And it's not obvious to me at all that one of the consequences of Barack Obama's presidency was a reduction in racial tension in the United States. No, I wouldn't agree with that either. I think a lot of people found having a black college-educated professor very alarming and threatening to their idea well, of themselves of them as the dominant group. not enough to stop them from voting for him twice. No, that is very true, but again... It's fundamentally true, right? It's, it's really the crucial issue at hand here. No, but he built a big coalition of white, well-educated liberals and people of color. I mean, that is the, that is the Democrat electorate. Well, how do you explain the rise of racial tension in the United States then? Well, I think it's caused by a lot of things, not the least of one of which is the Republican Party inflaming it. You talk about the left playing identity politics. I think the right play identity politics all the time. The right doesn't dominate the universities. No, and but it dominates. Trump, but example, Donald Trump is president. So realistically, Donald Trump is hardly a typical Republican. No, he. I used to say that he. Accomplished In fact, most of, for most of his life, if I remember correctly, he was a Democrat. Right. I don't think he has right. any. So political we're not going to blame Donald Trump on the right wing. Okay, but I'm going to say the rest of the Republican Party are also quite happy to play, I would say, white identity politics. They, go, they did not d dump him as their candidate when he said, Mexicans, they're not sending us their best people here, they're rapists, right? The whole idea of the United States, it said, I think a beautiful thing, all men are created equal, but it meant men, and it meant specifically white men, women and black people could not vote. The US was founded on identity politics. This is not some new concept that has come along in the last 20 years. The United States wasn't founded on identity yes, politics. Yes, it was. That's an absolutely absurd proposition. The United States was founded on the same principles that, um, what would you say, that, that played their powerful role through the development of, of, of English democracy. And that was nested inside a Judeo-Christian view that fundamentally presumed that both men and women were made in the image of God and that all people had divine value. And it took a long time for that set of ideas to fully manifest itself in the political realm. But to consider that a manifestation of identity politics is, I, I, I can't imagine why you would possibly do that. I don't consider that a manifestation of identity politics. I consider having a constitution that says only some people are citizens to be a manifestation of identity politics. Well, what do you think changed it across time? And, uh, and, and look, let's get our definition straight here. You can't lump all occurrences of... Uh, 
non-equal treatment into the category of identity politics. Identity politics is a very specific thing. It's really only existed since the 1970s. You can't go back into to 1770 and say that the founders of the American Constitution were playing identity politics. So they were playing you might politics that, that was based on identity. That's my definition of identity that's politics. That's not the definition of identity politics unless you pay, play fast and loose with the definition. Identity politics is something that's... In, no one talked about identity politics 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's a new term. You, you can't say that people's proclivity to identify with their group is identity politics. That's just tribalism. And that's like, who knows how old that is? A million years old. 500,000 years old. And you're going to call tribalism identity politics? Well, that's not helpful. If you want to talk about tribalism, we could talk about tribalism. But identity politics is something that's nested inside a particular political view of the world. It's got a Marxist basis, and it manifests itself in postmodernism. And it emerged in the American Union, France first, in the 1970s, and then has swept through the American universities and increasingly the rest of the West since then. That's identity politics. If you want to talk about tribalism, that's fine. I'm not a fan of tribalism, which is why I don't like the identity politics types. And I don't care if they're on the right or the left. I think the right-wing use of identity as the primary marker for human categorization is as reprehensible and dangerous as it is on the left. My problem with the left at the moment, the fundamental problem with the radical left, is that they're hyper-dominant in academia. And that's not good. And that's not my opinion. You can go look at Jonathan Haidt's data and see for yourself. And he's as moderate a person as you could hope to find. And probably less prone to anger than me. And, and I agree with you. I find a lot of students phenomenally irritating. But I would question how much power they have it's in contrast the to the things that I find more worrying that are happening in the world today. right? Or even the professors. right? Even Look, the professors. 20-year-olds don't have that much power. But they're not 20 forever. 10 years later, they're 30. And, and 20 years later, they're 40. Right, and, and whatever happens in the university happens everywhere five years later. And very, very sadly for people in my politics, left-wing politics, what happens to people as they get older is that they've traditionally got more conservative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can make a case that the, the, the current... Where people are where they're 20 today is actually going to be the ideology that takes them all the way through their life. That's never been the case no, but so it'll far. No, but it'll be around long enough to do plenty of damage, like it already is. Okay, but so. even if we accept that students and their POMO professors are quite annoying, which I think is probably I agree, something I it's agree not, with They're not on. just annoying. Like, they're destroying the universities, and that's not a good thing. And they're particularly destroying the social sciences and the humanities. The sciences are safe so far, but not for long. Because the scientists in particular are terrible at politics, and the left-wing activists are great at politics. And so they'll win eventually. The National Science Foundation is already introducing diversity requirements for hiring in mathematics in universities. It's like, good luck with that. That's not going to work. There are hardly any mathematical geniuses. If you start putting all sorts of arbitrary restrictions on their hiring, you're just going to not end, you're going to end up not finding the ones that there are. So... Besides, I don't think that's true, actually, because if you say there are very few yeah, mathematical genes... what do you know about it? Well, I'm, I want, next year I'm going to be a fellow at Oxford University, so I spend time talking to academics. I've talked to a lot of academics for my book. I do agree with you, there is an illiberal strain that is sweeping through a lot of universities. I don't think it's an existential threat. How would your life have been different if you'd been born female? Multiple orgasms.